Volume 1, Chapter 7 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 7 During the first year I was still vain. I sometimes lied to excuse myself to my husband and mother-in-law. I stood strangely in awe of them. Sometimes I fell into a temper. Their conduct appeared so very unreasonable, and especially they countenancing the most provoking treatment of the girl who served me as to my mother-in-law her age and rank rendered her conduct more tolerable but thou o oh my god opened my eyes to see things in a very different light i found in thee reasons for suffering which I had never found in the creature. I afterward saw clearly and reflected with joy that this conduct, as reasonable as it seemed and as mortifying as it was, was quite necessary for me. Had I been applauded here as I was at my father's, I should have grown intolerably proud i had a fault common to most of our sex i could not bear a beautiful woman praised without finding fault to lessen the good which was said of her this fault continued long and was the fruit of cross and malignant pride extravagantly extolling any one proceeds from a like source just before the birth of my first child they were induced to take great care of me my crosses were somehow mitigated indeed i was so ill that it was enough to excite the compassion of the most indifferent they had so great a desire of having children to inherit their fortunes that they were continually afraid lest I should any way hurt myself. Yet, when the time of my delivery drew near, this care and tenderness of me abated. Once, as my mother-in-law had treated me in a very grating manner, I had the malice to feign a colic, to give them some alarm. But as I saw this little artifice gave them too much pain, I told them I was better. No creature could be more heavily laden with sickness than I was. Besides continual heavings, I had so strange a distaste except for some fruit, that I could not bear the sight of food. I had continual soonings and violent pains. After my delivery, I continued weak a long time. There was indeed sufficient to exercise patience, and I was enabled to offer up my sufferings to our Lord. I took a favor which rendered me so weak that after several weeks I could scarcely bear to be moved or to have my bed made. When I began to recover, an abscess fell upon my breast, which was forced to be let open in two places, which gave me great pain. Yet all the maladies seemed to me only a shadow of troubles in comparison with those I suffer in the family 
which daily increased. Indeed, life was so wearisome to me that some maladies which were thought mortal did not frighten me. The event improved my appearance and consequently served to increase my vanity. I was glad to call forth expressions of regard. I went to the public promenades, though but seldom, and when in the streets I pulled off my mask out of vanity. I drew off my gloves to show my hands. Could there be greater folly? After falling into these weaknesses, I used to weep bitterly at home, yet when occasion offered, I fell into them again. My husband lost considerably. This cost me strange crosses, not that I care for the losses, but I seem to be the bad of all the ill humors of the family. With what pleasure did I sacrifice temporal blessings? How often I felt willing to have begged my bread, if God had so ordered it. But my mother-in-law was inconsolable. She bid me pray to God for these things. To me, that was wholly impossible. O oh, my dearest Lord, never could I pray to Thee about the word or the things thereof, nor sally my sacred addresses to Thy Majesty with the dirt of the earth. No, I rather wish to renounce it all, and everything beside whatsoever, for the sake of Thy love and the enjoyment of Thy presence in that kingdom which is not of this word. I wholly sacrificed myself to thee, even earnestly begging thee, rather to reduce our family to beggary, than suffer it to offend thee. In my own mind, I excused my mother-in-law, saying to myself, If I had taken the pains to scrape and save, I will not be so indifferent at seeing so much lost. I enjoy what cost me nothing, and reap what I have not sowed. Yet all these thoughts could not make me sensible to our losses. I even form agreeable ideas of our going to the hospital. No state appeared to me so poor and miserable, which I should not have thought easy in comparison with the continual domestic persecutions I underwear. My father, who loved me tenderly, and whom I honor beyond expression, knew nothing of it. God so permitted that I should have him also displeased with me for some time. My mother was continually telling him that I was an ungrateful creature, showing no regard for them, but all for my husband's family. Appearances were against me. I did not go to see them as often as I should. They knew not the captivity I was in. What was I obliged to bear in defending them? These complaints of my mother and a trivial affair that fell out lessened a little my father's fond regard for me, but it did not last long. My mother-in-law reproached me, saying, No afflictions befell them till I came into the house. All misfortunes came with me. On the other hand, my mother wanted me to exclaim against my husband, which I could never submit to do. 
we continued to meet with loss after loss. The king, retrenching a considerable share of our revenues, besides great sums of money which we lost by La Hotel de Belle, I could have no rest or peace in such great afflictions. I had no mortal to console me or to advise me. My sister, who had educated me, had departed this life. She died two months before my marriage. I had no other for a confidant. I declare that I find much repugnance in saying so many things of my mother-in-law. I have no doubt that my own indiscretion, my caprice, and the occasional sallies of a warm temper drew many of the crosses upon me. Although I had what the word calls patience, yet I had neither a relish nor love for the cross. They conduct toward me which appears so unreasonable should not be looked upon with worldly eyes. We should look higher, and then we shall see that it was directed by providence for my eternal advantage. I now dressed my hair in the most modest manner, never painted, and to subdue the vanity which still had possession of me, I rarely looked in the glass. My reading was confined to books of devotion, such as Thomas Kemby's and the works of St. Francis de Sales. I read this aloud for the improvement of the servants while the maid was dressing my hair. I suffer myself to be dressed just as she pleased, which freed me from a great deal of trouble. It took away the occasions wherein my vanity used to be exercised. I knew not how things were, but they always liked me, and thought all well in point of dress. If on some particular days I wanted to appear better, it proved worse. The more indifferent I was about dresses, the better I appear. How often have I gone to church, not so much to worship God, as to be seen. Other women, jealous of me, affirmed that I painted. They told my confessor, which chided me for it, though I assured him I was innocent. I often spoke in my own praise, and so to raise myself by depreciating others. Yet these faults gradually deceased, for I was very sorry afterward for having committed them. I often examined myself very strictly, writing down my faults from week to week and from month to month, to see how much I was improved or reformed. Alas, this labor, though fatiguing, was of but little service, because I trusted in my own efforts. I wished indeed to be reformed, but my good desires were weak and languid. At one time my husband's absence was so long and in the meantime my crosses and vexations at home so great that I determined to go to him. My mother-in-law strongly opposed it. This, once my father interfering and insisting on it, she let me go. On my arrival I found he had almost died. Through vexation and fretting, he was very much changed. 
he could not finish his affairs having no liberty in attending to them keeping himself concealed at the hotel de longeville where madame de longeville was extremely kind to me i came publicly and he was in great fear lest i should make him known in a rage he bid me return home love and my long absence from him surmounting every other reason he soon relented and suffered me to stay with him he kept me eight days without letting me steer out of his sight fearing the effects of such a close confinement on my constitution he desired me to go and take a walk in the garden there i met madame de longeville who testified great joy on seeing me i cannot express all the kindness i met with in this house all the domestics served me with emulation and applauded me on account of my appearance and exterior deportment yet i was much on my guard against too much attention i never entered into discourse with any man when alone i admitted none into my coach not even my relations unless my husband were in it there was not any rule of discretion which i did not duly observe to avoid giving suspicion to my husband or subject of calumny to others everyone studied there how to contribute to divert or oblige me outwardly everything appeared agreeable chuckling had so overcome and ruffled my husband that i had continually something to bear sometimes he threatened to throw the supper out of the windows i said she would then do me an injury as i had a keen appetite i made him laugh and i laugh with him before that melancholy prevailed over all my endeavors and over the love he had for me god both armed me with patience and gave me the grace to return him no answer the devil who attempted to draw me into some offence was forced to retire in confusion through the signal assistance of that grace i loved my god and was unwilling to displease him and i was inwardly grieved on account of that vanity which still i found myself unable to eradicate inward distresses together with oppressive crosses which i had daily to encounter at length drew me into sickness as i was unwilling to incommode the hotel de longeville had myself moved to another house the disease proved violent and tissues in so much that the physicians despaired of my life the priest a pious man seemed fully satisfied with the state of my mind he said i should die like a saint but my sins were too present and too painful to my heart to have such presumption at midnight they administered the sacrament to me as they hourly expected my departure it was a sense of general distress in the family and among all who knew me 
there were none indifferent to my death but myself i beheld it without fear and was insensible to its approach it was father otherwise with my husband he was inconsolable when he saw there was no hope i no sooner began to recover than notwithstanding all his love his usual fretfulness returned i recovered almost miraculously and to me this disorder proved a great blessing beside a very great patience under violent pains it served to instruct me much in my view of the emptiness of all worldly things it detached me from myself and gave me new courage to suffer better than i had done the love of god gathered strength in my heart with a desire to please and be faithful to him in my condition i reaped several other advantages from it which i need not relate i had yet six months to drag along with a slow favor it was thought that it would terminate in death thy time o oh my god had not yet arrived for taking me to thyself thy designs over me were widely different from the expectations of those about me it being thy determination to make me both the object of thy mercy and the victim of thy justice End of chapter 7 of volume 1